Move friends. I know it's not the greatest idea to start a video by blowing my own trumpet, but I'm just so excited because I think I just finished one of my best, if not the best, Dharama so far. And I'm so excited to show you the whole process. Yeah, it's very simple, but it has a lot going on. There's resin water, heavy mud, grass, a tree with some falling leaves. I mean, the whole nine. And it comes in such a small package, but I think what really sets it off are the wood stained sides. So yeah, no more black sides, at least not on this one. But anyway, let's go and see how it became what it is. Every diorama in my collection starts its life as a large block of styrofoam. This has many advantages, and the best ones being the light weight of the material, but more importantly, the ability to make the dimensions absolutely perfect for our needs. I've been told that some of my bases are needlessly tall, and here I'm putting that feedback to good use. Oh, and guess what? It's gonna look much better this way. I plan to put the valentine tank on a small incline from the beginning, and a simple strip of foam held in place with double-sided tape is gonna do the trick here. Another advantage of this method is that you can pile any amount of features on top of the base, and then simply use the hot wire cutter to make it all nice and tidy. So that's our composition. Small, easy to read, but I was also a bit worried that it would be too simple, as in boring. But even simple scenes can be interesting to look at, so let's continue with the fun stuff. As a starting point, I like to cover the entire surface of the diorama with acrylic texture paste from AK. It slightly reinforces the material, but more importantly, provides a coarse, grippy surface for the next layer. And that one is going to be VMS Smart Mud, which is an awesome terrain sculpting acrylic... Um, not really clay, it's much softer than that, it's more like foam or sand. Because this scene takes place in heavy mud, I sculpted the ground in multiple steps, and the most important one is making sure that the tank will be slightly sunken into the ground. As such, I applied it around its tracks, sprinkled it with real earth from my garden, trademark, and without letting it to dry too much, I placed the tank exactly where it should be. Sometimes, depending on the terrain and the model, a firm press against the ground is all that's needed to achieve our goal, but when this simple trick doesn't cut it, the soft ground can be carefully pushed against the tracks. I like to apply dry dirt on top of the clay for two reasons. It adds more of that realistic texture, but it also makes the surface less sticky. I definitely wouldn't be stoked if those finished tank tracks would suddenly become clogged with unpainted, messy groundwork. Another important detail is the track marks, because the tank wasn't lowered into the scene by a crane or anything. And this is also smart to do as soon as possible, while the clay is still soft. Okay, I think that's the best we can do in this area, so let's get rid of the tank and finish the rest of the scene. I actually waited for a while so the first layer of clay would solidify a bit, because now I'm gonna be sculpting on top of it. I love using this clay and if you'd like to try it as well, then I have good news for you. You can shop directly from VMS and use this code to get a discount on your entire order, or buy their stuff through Michigan Toy Soldier Company if you're based in America, and also get a discount with this code. I've seen plenty of images of dirt roads absolutely destroyed by heavy machinery, and even some cases where there was no road to begin with, but a few dozen passing tanks completely destroyed every bit of vegetation, leaving a muddy road in their wake. I applied the smart mud in a thicker layer so there would be plenty of material that I could push out with my spare tracks, and to enhance this look, I even pulled the raised edges of each rut with a sculpting brush. I wanted to have as much muddy texture in this scene as possible. A final test with the dry fitted tank, and I think we're looking pretty good. I also dry fitted the unpainted figures to see how the composition is gonna look like, but also it was so I could press the machine gun soldier into the ground, just like the tank. Once the ground was rock hard, I could start tidying up the scene. 
I chose 0.6 mm thick oak veneer. I had this one for a while, but I keep using its thinner 0.4 mm variant because it's more discreet and easier to cut. But because there are no complicated features in this scene, even this one is gonna do the job. The quickest way of laminating the styrofoam is by using double-sided tape. The bond is instant and very firm. It works like a dream on oval or round bases, but is just as effective on straight lines. If it acts flimsy in a few places, a drop of super glue will hold it firmly in place. However, in this case, because I was going to treat the sides with wood stain, I was very careful and tried to work as cleanly as possible. Any drop of glue on the surface, or any other imperfection, would mess up the staining process, quite effectively ruining the whole fancy pants look. What I like about this workflow is the ability to seamlessly blend the wooden sides with the terrain. When you have that wood visible, it gives the diorama a picture-in-the-frame look, so to say. But when you do it like this, it gives the illusion that the scene continues way beyond the boundaries of the diorama. Because this step pretty much seals the deal with our groundwork efforts, I added the final layer of dirt and some dried seagrass and permanently fixed everything in place by first soaking the surface with alcohol and then dropping some diluted PVA glue on top of the wet surface. Alcohol breaks the surface tension and the loose ground then acts as a sponge. We can leave the entire scene for a few hours to dry and in the meantime, let's take a look at the tree. I was so stoked to try these bushes I brought home from my Spain trip, and as my friend Oscar told me, it's thyme. These plants grow absolutely everywhere in the Spanish countryside, and they're just perfect for this job. I'm not surprised that so many great dioramas with trees come from Spanish modelers. The process is really just about finding the best shape for our tree and then adding a few extra tweaks. Super glue works well enough here, although it would have been much easier if I had a bit of super glue activator. What used to take me hours of collecting the right twigs in my garden, trademark, can now be finished in a fraction of the time, and most of that is spent doing the actual creative stuff. I also added a wire at the bottom which will secure it to the diorama, but also to a cork stopper for easier painting. Now, there is going to be a fair amount of sculpting involved and Tamiya smooth type epoxy putty is ideal for the job because it's very soft. Thyme has an awesome bark texture on its own, so I didn't have to go over the entire thing, but I made sure to nicely blend the additional twigs with the main tree body. I also added it around the trunk to make it thicker, otherwise it would look just like another branch. In fact, this is just my second tree ever, I did the first one roughly two years ago, but this workflow was much more pleasant and faster. To make those really small branches, I used seafoam trees. I don't know why they're called like that, because they have a very strong spicy smell, but I'm no expert, so I'm just gonna call them seafoam. Unfortunately, they have these seeds, which I suppose are some kind of spice or something, and to make them look more authentic, you guessed it, they have to be removed one by one. However, fun times are ahead, because now it's just about making the tree look more busy, and adding the individual sea foam branches with super glue. The amount is completely a matter of personal taste, and I wanted to make the tree look just right, you know, not too much, not too little. These branches are very delicate, but it's good to blend them as well. AK Texture Paste works really well for that, and as a bonus, although it's no surprise, it adds also a nice texture. Finally, I made the very bottom of the trunk even thicker, because this is where the roots branch out, although, as I found out in nature, exposed roots are quite rare in flat areas. It's more common to see them in the mountains. So, yeah, that's the tree and it was a real pleasure to work on it. If I wasn't waiting for the putty to dry, the whole thing would have been finished in maybe two hours tops. Moving on with the finishing touches in the construction department, it was time to add some dense foliage on the ground. Most of it is just tall grass, but I added a few tweaks as well. I like to structure the grass cover in three layers most of the time. The first one, acting as a bed of sorts, 
is applied through a static grass applicator. The individual stalks are roughly 4 mm long, so they can fall quite easily through the applicator mesh. As such, it's a very simple and quick job, and it gives me a pretty good idea about the overall grass layout. These longer 1 cm stalks are easier to plant with tweezers. They're just too long to fall through the applicator mesh in any reasonable amounts, but even then, I find the hand application to be more natural looking. There's just the right amount of randomness that gives it a pretty authentic look. And finally, when it comes to very long stalks, I like to use a paintbrush where I can cut them to any length I desire. The principle is the same, but the longer the stalk, the smaller the ground coverage. So that's our scene in its raw state. I'd say the grass color would have been quite passable if this was going to be a summer scene, but because I'm going for an autumn setting, I'll be able to show you how we can use paints to shift the color palette anywhere we want. But first, let's treat the sides. I chose this oak wood stain because it looked really good on sample pieces, but as you saw at the beginning of the video, the final result is much darker. I'll talk about it more when the time comes to address it, but even this result was very pleasing to my eye. It's really cool to see the nice wood texture stand out. And because the sides were already treated, that meant masking. I'm not a fan of masking at all, but luckily, the process is very efficient. I grabbed a fresh hobby blade and carefully traced the outline of the groundwork. Of course, the cut wasn't absolutely perfect, but it was just good enough to protect the sides while giving me plenty of room to play around with paints. And I gotta say, it looks pretty cool, all masked up like this. Anyway, time for the most enjoyable part of the workflow. As always, I started with a generous coat of dark primer. I use black Mr. Surfacer almost exclusively when it comes to models and figures, but for groundwork, I found that mahogany primer works much better. It doesn't create that cold, desaturated effect once everything is post-shaded. The tree has many different materials involved, so here it was an absolute necessity, and we'll take advantage of this dark undercoat in just a moment. Now, airbrushing grass is one of the most satisfying jobs for me, and here I wanted to put as much effort into it as possible. In reality, it just meant using one more color than usual, but anyway, the bottom paint, and by the bottom I mean towards the bottom of the grass, was flat earth. Dry grass has all kinds of different shades starting from brown, through reddish brown, to almost off-white in some cases. The remaining dry tones were created with dark yellow, where I later added a bit of white to make it lighter. Painting the grass with such a color gradient makes it look more three-dimensional, but also more realistic in my opinion, even though hard realism is not my goal anymore. And the dark primer plays also a very important role, because we're spraying the grass in thin, controlled layers, we want to reach the deepest areas that were previously primed. As such, it creates a fake shadow of sorts, making the grass look denser than it actually is. As in, it's so dense that you can't even see through it, and it's all just an optical illusion. How cool is that? That was the long, old, withered grass. The short tufts are usually young, fresh grass, and they often stay green even during winter. So my usual color combination of NATO green and yellow green was the winning choice. I was slightly worried that it might be too vivid for this scene, but as you'll see, the earth effects will tone it down significantly. The tree was painted in grayish, desaturated tones. When you look outside, you'll quickly notice that most trees have a very gray-looking bark. Mostly due to weathering, I presume, but I'm no botanist. But I kept the base coat reasonably light, because the washes will darken it a lot. And finally, I gave the muddy ground a very thin coat of post-shading as well. It's just a coincidence that I'm using the same tone as on the tree, but it's also the same dry earth color I used to pre-dust the tank. So yeah, the difference right now is quite remarkable, although it's just a base coat and it's gonna change even further. But this already shows why I'm not concerned about specially colored static grass or any of that stuff. 
you can change the color palette to anything you want with an airbrush. And it's not even a lot of work when your dioramas are reasonably small. Okay, let's now treat the ground with these three gentlemen. One of the most important things in dioramas, at least for me, is harmonizing every element of the scene. In the case of groundwork, it means matching the color of the ground with the earth effects on the tank, or vice versa, as was the case in my Maschinenkrieger diorama. But point is, the weathering on the tank should reflect the environment, and using the same colors and special effects is the easiest and most logical way to achieve that. I just found that changing the workflow a little makes the task much easier. When I was weathering the tank, I started with the lightest tone, rain marks effect, and continued with darker and darker tones. Here I started with the mid tone, dark mud, followed by fresh mud, which is the darkest tone. These two alone, combined with the light colored post shading of the ground, created a very authentic looking muddy surface that looks exactly like the mud on the tank's running gear. And because the ground is supposed to be all mud, no dry tones, I didn't even use those rain marks effects, at least not in their pure state. Instead, I mixed them with dark mud and applied this mixture in the form of dry brushing, and just on the highest areas. It nicely brings out the fine detail in the groundwork and makes any terrain features, be it track imprints or the raised edges of the rutted road, more three-dimensional. It's a very straightforward workflow and the results are pretty predictable. As a small side note, I recently teamed up with AK Interactive after my visit to their offices in Spain. And guess what? I have a discount code for you. You can use it once every three months, but then there will be a new code, so make it count. And if you'd like, you can visit their store through my affiliate link in the video description. It will help me out and won't cost you anything extra. Anyway, back to the diorama. I was able to airbrush the entire scene and finish the earth effects in one day. And because the grass doesn't need any additional work, a good portion of our diorama is actually done. Being able to see instant results is very motivating, and I felt like the masking tape on the sides is no longer needed. But this is where I was met with an unpleasant surprise. You see, the pale wood stain doesn't work with the gloomy tones in the diorama at all. And I only realized this once I removed the tape. So you can probably imagine it wasn't a cool moment at all. Not to be discouraged, I went out and bought another, much darker wood stain. I knew the previous layer would affect the final tone, but hey, the difference is huge right from the get-go. I was gonna say that it's better to apply the wood stain once you have the ground painted because you'll be able to decide what tone is gonna work better, but then I thought it's maybe just about finding one specific tone that's gonna work for all your dioramas. But we'll see in the future. But as I said, seeing instant results is very satisfying and always boosts my creative mojo, so the next day I proceeded with the tree. I knew that this important feature will take some time and effort to finish properly, but I was looking forward to the entire process. The pale base coat paid off big time as the enamel wash darkened the overall tone, but most importantly, it outlined the nice bark texture. I could use this as a foundation for more refined brush painting with grayish acrylic paints. One would say that dry brushing is a more efficient approach here, but I found that careful brush application offers way more control over the result. And it's actually surprising how fast the process is. As you see, there is some color variation on tree trunks, but it's rather subtle. So there's no need to go ham with I don't know how many different colors. Most of my effort was just about adding some nice textured gradients on the bark and some fresh exposed wood in those damaged areas. What really makes trees pop for me is the heavy moss accumulation on the north facing side. As I learned during this diorama, moss is heavily dependent on moisture and there's plenty of that in the autumn months. Check this out, I shot these two pictures in my garden and they're only three days apart. The difference? It rained in the meantime and the moss suddenly popped seemingly out of nowhere, even though it was always there, just dormant. I like to paint moss in very vivid tones, but they have to be kept subtle. 
As such, I like to apply a dark brown color over the entire thing as a heavy wash, and then, while it's still wet, gently touch the moss with lighter green tones, letting the wet spongy material absorb them. The results are absolutely awesome when the water evaporates. It just takes a lot of time. So while that's happening, how about we add some leaves? These oak leaves are pretty awesome because you get a small bag that's absolutely full of them. I was used to buying these small plastic boxes where you had maybe, I don't know, 50 leaves, so we had to use them very sparingly, but this? This is pretty cool. And yes, as you'd imagine, I glued each one of them individually with tweezers. Don't get me wrong, I tried sprinkling them over the tree, but most of them fell flat on my workbench, and this way I can at least control their placement and the direction they're pointing in. The whole process took me no more than 3 hours, so it wasn't that bad. And it was actually quite relaxing, although my back would probably argue with that statement. But let's make them even better, okay? I was so happy that I could use oil paints in this diorama because they're such an awesome medium. I appreciate that these leaves come in nice, vibrant autumn colors, but they didn't feel that authentic to me. But they're made from paper, and that's a very absorbent material, so applying diluted rust washes over each one of them was a total blast. And once again, the results are immediate, and that always puts my motivation through the roof. I even added some of them on the small twigs in the diorama, so I guess we have a bunch of baby oaks sprouting out of the ground now. <laughs> so what do you think, my friends? Autumn might be my new favorite setting for dioramas because the color palette is absolutely insane, but at the same time, a partially covered tree isn't very time consuming to finish. The whole thing took me two days, and I'll let you decide if that's way too much or way too little time to finish a scale tree. But yeah, now I could super glue it in place, and because it's such a huge element in this scene, it completely transformed the entire diorama. I was so stoked with the results so far that I quickly went ahead and added some fallen leaves on the ground. Yes, I also glued these individually, but that's not a big deal. What's really important here is their integration with the groundwork, especially those that are on the muddy road. I covered those almost entirely with enamel mud tones. And to finish the scenery completely, I painted some of the rocks in various greyish tones, just to add a final layer of detail. So that's the scene pretty much finished, and I kid you not, I started airbrushing it on Wednesday morning and finished the fallen leaves on Thursday evening. I didn't have so much diorama energy in me for quite a while. But let's not get too stoked though, because it's time to make some dangerous decisions. I sprayed the road with a thick layer of Tamiya gloss varnish as a preparation for the muddy water. The tank will be glued to the base during this process as well, so it needs to be positioned perfectly. And the sides need to be precisely taped off so no resin will spill out. That's right, we're doing it with resin. It has to be mixed in a 2 to 1 ratio, so I grabbed 6 milliliters of resin and 3 milliliters of hardener. 9 milliliters of a total volume seemed just enough for such a small body of water. I used khaki from Tamiya to give it a nice, muddy appearance. I used this paint in my 1917 diorama and the result looks just like black tea with milk. Which is the perfect definition of muddy water, if you ask me. This was working in very tight conditions, so I couldn't just pour the resin straight out of the cup, but ration it very carefully into each rut. I was quite unpleasantly surprised to see some of the resin disappearing straight into the ground, which meant that my sealing efforts with clear varnish weren't the most successful. As such, those 9 milliliters were spent to the last drop. However, I knew that this effect would have to be finished in two stages, and with very different mediums. Resin was an obvious choice because it levels itself out perfectly and dries into a rock-hard finish. Its main disadvantage is that it tends to crawl up anything it touches. Well, there are always pros and cons when it comes to artificial water, at least in my limited experience. So the next day I removed the tape and I noticed how the water changed color from that murky brown to something 
very weird and greenish. This didn't happen on any of my previous water dioramas, and my suspicion is that the resin somehow reacted with the enamel effects. But it wasn't such tragedy, because there was still that second layer coming in. I just made sure to slice off those ugly edges where it crawled up the masking tape. The second coat is made from tinted steel water. Unlike resin, it's acrylic based, and even when it dries it has a very rubbery quality to it. I had to use flat earth instead of khaki this time to cover up that greenish tint, but luckily it worked like a dream. Steel water also has pretty high surface tension, which is great because it doesn't crawl like resin. In fact, it can be used as a leveling layer, and with some patience, you can get rid of those raised edges like a boss. But sadly, no instant results here. In fact, the steel water needs additional 24 hours to fully dry, so in the meantime, I decided to paint the two soldier figures. I said in the previous video that I'll show the process in more detail, so that's what I'm gonna do, even though my painting workflow has been the same for more than two years now. I absolutely love using the black and white pre-shading method, although instead of pure white I like to use deck tan. But the point is the same, you create lights and shadows with an airbrush, and then add the actual colors in the form of glazes. These are heavily watered down translucent paint mixtures, and the point is to apply enough layers to have a nice vivid color, but not too much, otherwise the pre-shading would disappear. The remainder of the techniques is very simple as well, because we have an excellent base coat that will guide us for the rest of the journey. Basically, I like to start by outlining every detail with a black-brown paint mixture. This doesn't have to be perfect, because we can refine it later with highlights. At this stage, I also like to enhance the shadows with the same color mixture, I just dilute it down with more water. It often seems that the figure is becoming too dark at this stage, but it all changes very fast. When it comes to highlights, I like to keep them simple. This means using the base color and adding a fair amount of something very light. Light earth works in most cases. Because I'm not constructing the lights from multiple layers, I mix one tone that's brighter than anything else, and adjust its opacity with water. One layer of highlights is usually enough for my purposes, although I like to use one more, quite an extreme round of highlights. In some cases, I grab the color I used to make the previous mixture lighter, but focus it on the smallest details, especially those that I outlined in the previous steps, and I also add it in tiny amounts on the edges of the strongest highlights. It's a tiny detail, but it adds a lot of punch to the final result. And if by any chance the contrasts are too harsh, or the overall tone is not what we expected, another glaze can quickly turn it into a more pleasant finish but I don't use it all the time. And just like that, the biggest and most prominent parts of the figure are finished. It's a smooth process, but it still takes some time and patience, and each part of the uniform takes a few hours to finish. The same pre-shaded surface can be used in other places, such as these shin wraps, but smaller details are much easier to paint with a different approach. These usually don't create any interesting shadows with an airbrush, so I find it much easier to just base coat them with black brown and then paint the base coat, creating some shadows in the process, and finish with highlights. It's a more of the traditional way of painting. Now, people say that faces and skin tones in general are the most crucial part of any figure, and I agree, but I'll be honest here. Even after two years, or how long it's been since my first figure, I always feel a bit nervous when it comes to them. Some figure painters advise you to start with these, because if things go badly, you can clean the whole figure and start all over. But for me, it's much better to keep them until the very end, because that's when I'm fully immersed in the painting process and my muscle memory has been refreshed by all those previous surfaces that I have already painted. Also, it's a plain fact that a better sculpted figure with a more detailed face is gonna be much easier to paint. Panzer art is an absolute leader in my opinion when it comes to incredible detail, but then again, they have 3D sculpted figures. These ones from Evolution Miniatures have been hand sculpted, which is an incredible art form in my opinion. 
and while their faces are rather smooth, the details are nicely defined. I mean, I was even able to paint their eyes. Not in a great way, but sufficient for my style. And that's the result of my efforts. Two comrades helping each other paint it completely with acrylic paints. But I'm gonna give them some enamel treatment, because right now they look very clean for that muddy, wet setting of the diorama. Applying earth tones on figures is very different from armor though. The usual brush it on then blend it approach wouldn't work here because most of the paint would accumulate in the shadowed areas, so instead I found that gentle stippling works much better as it distributes the paint more evenly. And if you're lucky, the stippling motion also blends the paint, but if not, a small amount of enamel thinner will do the job. And here they are already super glued in place. The subtle weathering is very important if you want to seamlessly integrate your figures into the scene. And as luck would have it, I think their color palette fits really nicely into the whole diorama. So anyway, my friends, that's the end of this project and I'm so, so happy with the result. As I said at the beginning, although the scene is quite simple, I feel like it's the best diorama I made so far. Everything in this project just clicked together from the very beginning. Even the construction of the Valentine tank was a total blast, even though it was a kit patch of two different models. You know, I don't want to sound pretentious or self-centered, but I'm really proud of this one. I guess it's because I wasn't expecting much, and my expectations were pretty mellow. There was one moment where I felt like I could have done better, and it was the muddy water. Somehow, when I was done with it, I felt like the scene would look even more balanced if I just limited the puddles to a few large and deep holes in the ground and kept the rest as it was. But hey, everyone's a general when the battle's over and at least I was able to create an effect that I wanted to do for a long time. Another thing that sets this scene apart from my others is the wood-stained sides. And although I'm still a huge fan of black sides, there's something very appealing about nice dark wood. It was actually my girlfriend's idea to go with Woodstain because when I was showing her dioramas from my modeling idol, Volker Bembenek, she said they look as if someone carved out a piece of land, and that impression was enhanced by the Woodstain sides. Yeah, you should have seen the look on my face when she said that, because that has been my goal since... I don't know, since I started making dioramas. So yeah, let me know your thoughts on this. I already have an idea for the next scene, but before we get to that, I want to say a huge, sincere thanks to all of you, from the bottom of my heart. Because if it wasn't for you watching these videos, I wouldn't be here making dioramas every day as a full-time job. And I must give a special shout out to my wonderful, generous patrons who make this job even more possible. So if you like my work and would like to see more of it, and in return help me out, you can consider joining me on Patreon as well, where I have lots of cool stuff. It's basically a Night Shift magazine subscription, and I post there almost every day with updates from my workbench. We can also get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm for example posting one week early ad free videos and those stay there forever so we can always get back to them without even keeping track of these official uploads on my channel and I also have some small extra goodies such as 3D models which you can download and print for your own projects, a bunch of real life references for nature, old buildings and so on. And last but not least, these higher resolution studio photos, which show the model in more detail than video ever could. Yeah, it would help me a lot, but hey, no pressure. Anyway, my friends, there's not much more to say other than that I'm still very stoked about this little diorama. And if I ever start selling my own works to collectors, I think this one will be a keeper. I still have that leftover Valentine Mark IV turret from Tamiya laying somewhere in my studio, so that kinda gives me an idea for a small vignette, but no spoilers, okay? So until I'm back, you all stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!